straight ahead on Long Crime Daily. Details from inside the courtroom as Vanessa Bryant takes the stand in her lawsuit against officials over the sharing of photos of her husband Kobe and their daughter Gianna. Plus, it's very difficult these days to have a felony on your record. The attorney of a woman acquitted of killing her newborn baby sits down with law and crime after Skylar Richardson seeks to have her conviction sealed. And do everything that you can looking for fingerprints, DNA sample, anything else that might be there, there are gonna be forensic tiebacks. Almost a year after the fatal shooting on the set of Alec Baldwin's movie, Rust, the film's armor is slamming law enforcement over the investigation. But first, jurors hear explicit testimony from the former goddaughter of R&B singer R. Kelly as he faces federal child pornography charges in Chicago. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Terry Austin. Attorneys for R&B singer R. Kelly get the chance to question his former goddaughter, who was allegedly seen in several of his child pornography tapes when she was just 14, as she testifies against him in his federal trial in Chicago. The woman referred to as Jane is now 37 years old. She is testifying for the first time that she is the girl in his video, after denying it for years. Jane testified Thursday that Kelly told her she shouldn't share their relationship with anyone to demonstrate her loyalty to him. She said he asked her to recruit her friends, who were also minors, to participate in their sexual activities. She also testified that Kelly had her with hundreds of times before she turned 18. He raped her. Jane was at the center of Kelly's 2008 Illinois trial over child pornography charges. The singer was acquitted when Jane and her family denied it was her in the video. While Kelly denies any wrongdoing, he's charged with child pornography, enticement of minors, and conspiring to rig the 2008 trial by intimidating Jane not to testify. Kelly was already convicted last year of sex trafficking and racketeering in New York and was sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. Joining us today are defense attorney and guest co-host Bernardo Villalona, along with a law and crime legal analyst, Matt Mangini. Welcome. And Bernardo, I'm going to start with you. This witness, Jane Doe, refused to testify in the 2008 trial against R. Kelly. Do you think that will be used against her in this trial? Could the jurors not understand why she did that? So as you can see, the king of R&B is continuing his tour, and that is the tour of courthouses answering up for the charges that he has involving having sex with minors. So in regards to Jane, now we've known about Jane since the early 2000s because Jane is the same young girl that was pictured in a video where R. Kelly is allegedly urinating on top of her, and she wasn't cooperative with the state trial. That's going to be mentioned throughout the trial, especially during her cross-examination, because what the defense is trying to say is that she is not credible, that she has something to gain by this testimony. However, remember that one of the 13 charges that R. Kelly is facing is that of conspiring to, conspiring to intimidate a, a witness or a victim, and Jane is one of them because she was paid off and sent to the Bahamas with her family in order to avoid being present at the 2008 state trial that resulted in an acquittal because she did not testify. Right. Let's hope that there is a different result here. Now, law and crime analyst Matt Mangino, the defense has strenuously argued to keep any videotapes out of this trial. The expectation that portions of the tapes will be shown. How damaging is that going to be to the defense? Well, it's going to be very damaging. I mean, this they're going to observe uh, pornographic videos. They're going to see this victim, 14 years old, assaulted by R. Kelly. I mean, th these tapes uh, are going to be the centerpiece of this trial, uh, and they're going to be very harmful to R. Kelly. That's right. And maybe some of the jurors have already seen those tapes online. We just don't know. Hopefully not. Switching now to Texas, where the lawyer for Caitlin Armstrong, a woman charged with the murder of an elite cyclist, says police improperly interrogated his client and ignored her request to speak with the lawyer. Armstrong is charged in the May 11th shooting death of Anna Mariah Wilson, also known as Mo. Wilson was found shot to death in a friend's home while she was in Texas for a bike ride. 
Wilson had previously been romantically involved with Armstrong's boyfriend, Colin Strickland. Investigators say days after Wilson's murder, Armstrong fled the country. She was arrested weeks later in Costa Rica. Before all this happened, a warrant was issued for Armstrong over a 2018 incident after the yoga teacher failed to pay a spa's $650 bill for a Botox treatment. On May 12th, Armstrong was arrested and questioned about Wilson's death. Her attorney says Armstrong wasn't read her Miranda rights and that evidence was obtained illegally using the theft warrant. Armstrong's next hearing is set for next week. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, Ohio woman Skylar Richardson is seeking to have her conviction sealed two years since her acquittal of killing her newborn baby after her prom. But first, the armor from Alec Baldwin's movie Rust is questioning the investigation into the on-set shooting that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Welcome back. The attorney for the armor on the set of Rust is calling out sheriff's investigators after they didn't request some forensic testing in the case. Rust is the film where a cinematographer was shot and killed by Alec Baldwin last year. Law and Crime's Anjanette Levy is here with the details. Anjanette? Well, Terry, you may recall that Helena Hutchins died from a single gunshot wound. That gun was fired by Alec Baldwin, the actor. Director Joel Souza was wounded in that incident. In the film's armor, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was in charge of the firearms on the set. Now, Gutierrez-Reed's lawyer is questioning why the rounds in the gun that Baldwin fired were not tested for DNA evidence or fingerprints. This came after FBI test results were released earlier this week. Uh, which found that the gun could not have fired without pulling the trigger. Baldwin told ABC News that he didn't pull the trigger and that the first assistant director, Dave Halls, handed him the gun that day and said that it was safe. I asked forensic death investigator Joseph Scott Morgan what he thought of the rounds not being tested for either DNA or fingerprints. From an investigator standpoint, I think that it's important to go ahead and try to cut all of that static off early on in the investigation, do everything that you can, looking for fingerprints, DNA sample, anything else that might be there, there are gonna be forensic tiebacks. That way you can say that it has been done. The problem is, is that when you don't do things that could have been done, there will always be questions. And I guess you have to ask the question here, uh, is it too late? Now, I reached out to the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office to see whether or not they had a comment on Jason Bowles' uh, statement about this investigation. I was told that there would be no comment. Terry? Matt, let me ask you this. There's plenty of blame to go around in this case, including the armorer, the assistant director who handed Baldwin the gun, and Baldwin himself. At the end of the day, based on what you know so far, do you think anyone will be criminally charged in this case? Well, Terry, I think it's going to be a difficult prosecution for any of the individuals involved in this case, and precisely for uh, the reasons that you said. Uh, you know, number one, uh, you know, why is there live rounds? Why were there live rounds on the set? I mean, that's the first question. Who brought those live rounds to the set? Uh, number two, you know, a gun is, to is supposed to be cleared, uh, and in this situation, uh, it wasn't. And and why wasn't that done? And then ultimately, uh, we, we hear from Alec Baldwin that he didn't pull the trigger. We hear it's impossible. Someone had to pull the trigger. You know, this is sort of like a plane crash. I mean, a lot of things have to go wrong uh, for a plane to crash. And it appears in this situation uh, that there are a lot of problems. And now we learn about this lack of uh, forensic evidence when there was an opportunity to collect that forensic evidence. That, again, is going to be uh, a difficult uh, for a prosecution uh, of any of these individuals. So I don't see a prosecution like I don't think there's going to be the ability to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt of any individual person. I agree. This was a tragic situation. Now, Bernardo, let me turn it to you. Gutierrez Reed, she's the armor on the set, is asking for the DNA to confirm who actually placed the live rounds on that set, like Matt mentioned. 
we know there was only one official uh, supplier of those rounds, and that was Seth Kinney. How important is that DNA testing going to be? It's of huge importance, especially since the number one question is who loaded live rounds into that gun? That's the million dollar question in this case. So it's a huge misstep if law enforcement did not, did not request that it be tested in terms of either swab for DNA or dusted for fingerprints. It's either one or the other. You can't do both because it messes up the testing. But this is a huge misstep by law enforcement if they didn't do it. Either way, in terms of, yes, we know there's one guy who usually handles the supply of it. DNA would tell you that, yes, one person touched it. It won't tell you when they touch it, just that that person's DNA sample did touch that uh, shell casing or the cartridge. Right. And, Anjanette, what's the status of the investigation into Helena Hutchinson's death? Hutchinson's death. Well, it's ongoing, Terry. You know, we've asked several times when this could be handed over to the prosecutor for consideration and review. Um, they could consider some potential charges. We still don't have an answer on that. We know that we got those FBI test results back earlier this week uh, about how you can't fire a gun without pulling the trigger. We kind of all knew that. Um, we do know that they say that Hannah Gutierrez-Reed actually loaded the gun that day and said so in her statement to law enforcement. So uh, those are the things we know as it pertains to loading the gun and where the investigation stands. It's thanks. ongoing. Yeah, thanks everyone. Listen, coming up on Law & Crime Daily, an Ohio woman acquitted in the death of her newborn baby files a motion to have her conviction of the lesser charge, abuse of a corpse, sealed two years after her trial. Plus, the widow of Kobe Bryant testifies in California as she sues Los Angeles County following the fatal crash that killed her husband and daughter. Welcome back. The attorney of an Ohio woman acquitted of killing her newborn baby hours after her senior prom sits down with us a week after filing a motion to get her criminal conviction of a lesser charge sealed. In 2017, Richardson was just 18 years old when she secretly gave birth to a baby girl at her home, then buried the remains. She initially faced aggravated murder, involuntary manslaughter, and child endangerment charges. But she was acquitted and convicted of abusing of a corpse, which is still a felony crime. She was sentenced to seven days in county jail, which she had already served, and three years of community control. But 14 months later, a judge terminated that sentence. Richardson now wants the conviction record sealed. Her attorney, Charlie Rickers, says having a felony conviction, even a fifth-degree one, is still keeping her from moving forward with her life. It's very difficult these days to have a felony on your record and to be able to have gainful employment. Uh, a lot of opportunities are lost in simple things, even like where you can live, apartments that you can rent, um, but obvious things like education, higher education opportunities, which Skylar really wants to pursue, uh, as well as job opportunities uh, that she's lost out on uh, because she has this felony on her record. The prosecutors in the case tell Law and Crime he hasn't reviewed Richardson's request, but he plans to and will file a response with the court. Bernardo, let me turn to you. Richardson's attorney did an incredible job during the trial, knocking out those top charges. What are his chances of, you know, sealing the actual abuse of court's conviction? Absolutely, Terry. And I watched that trial from the beginning to the end, and the defense actually did an excellent job. And that's why it resulted with a non-homicide conviction. I think she has a good probability of getting her record sealed. And the reasons why is, number one, it's not a violent crime. Number two, she was, be able, she was able to actually follow the parameters of her supervision to the point that they even cut it short. And number three, let's see if the prosecutor is going to oppose the sealing. If the prosecutor doesn't oppose the sealing, then it's very likely that her record will be sealed. All great points. Thanks, Bernard and Matt. Let me turn to you. This was a widely publicized case. And I'm actually thinking, do you think the sealing of her conviction will help? Because, frankly, I think people already know all about what happened in this case. Well, that, that you may be right, Terry. And, uh, you know, she is convicted of a felony. And what 
what her attorney is talking about are the collateral consequences of crime, which everyone who's convicted of, of, of a felony uh, has to deal with. And those issues are, you know, job applications, uh, certain government benefits, uh, other uh, uh, educational matters. So, so, you know, this is a problem across the country for people convicted of, of felonies. And I think the fact that, that she has got off probation early might be an indication that, that she could get it sealed. Uh, but it is a major problem nationwide. Absolutely. And maybe they'll take the fact that she was young at the time into consideration. When we come back, Vanessa Bryant takes a stand in Los Angeles as the widow of the late Kobe Bryant testifies in her federal lawsuit against county officials. Welcome back. Vanessa Bryant takes the stand in her lawsuit against the County of Los Angeles as she sues for emotional distress over photos that were taken at the scene of the fatal helicopter crash that killed her husband and her daughter. The 2020 crash killed Kobe Bryant, their daughter Gianna, and seven others. Bryant's lawsuit claims close-up photos were taken of the remains of the basketball star and his daughter and that they were distributed among first responders and even shared with members of the public on several occasions. Friday morning, Vanessa Bryant wept on the stand, telling jurors she expected law enforcement to have more compassion and respect and that her husband and daughter deserved dignity. She said anyone who photographed her daughter's remains was, quote, taking advantage of the fact that her daddy couldn't protect her because he was at the morgue. Law and Crimes' Megan Cuniff was inside the courtroom for the emotional testimony. It was a big day with Vanessa Bryant uh, taking the stand, and that has really been uh, the most anticipated testimony. And uh, she she was emotional, but she was also very well composed. There were definitely some emotional moments and some heavy crying as she, you know, described her relationship with Kobe over the years. It was very emotional and heavy to hear her talk about these photos. And then then her her obviously very knowledgeable and, and, and smart analysis of what she saw in trial. I mean, she was really knowledgeable about the, the facts of the case and what the sheriff's department did here. Matt, let me turn to you first. The testimony of Vanessa Bryant was very emotional. The jury is instructed to follow the law, though. So how impactful do you think this testimony is going to be in front of that jury? Well, Terry, we know that uh, judges frequently admonish jurors, you know, not to be uh, taken by the emotion, to stick with the fact that, that, that they're hearing from uh, the witnesses, the people who take the witness stand. But in this case, you know, you can't overlook this emotion. It appears that her emotion was genuine. Uh, we heard that she was well prepared and well versed for her testimony. And if you convey that genuine emotion uh, to a jury, uh, you know, they're going to be sympathetic. It's just human nature. You can't separate that emotion uh, from the facts of the trial. And while I think they'll continue to admonish this jury to stick with the facts, they're not going to forget this compelling testimony. Absolutely. It sounds like it was extremely emotional in that courtroom. Bernarda, Vanessa Bryant is suing Los Angeles County technically for negligence, invasion of privacy, and also emotional distress. From a legal standpoint, do you think she will be successful? I think she's going to be successful. The question is going to be how much money will she be entitled to in terms of compensatory damages as well as punitive damages. I will be looking more at the punitive damages because that is how a jury sends a message and acknowledges that what you did was wrong and we need to prevent these types of actions from taking place again in the future. Especially you don't want investigators releasing photographs. You don't want that right. to happen. Thank you for joining us, and thank you all. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.